Either he doesn't want bonus points or he doesn't think he needs bonus points. I'll take my bonus points. Who is it? Who is it? Nick. All right, Nick. Make sure that you get bonus points later. All right, perfect. I see that the YouTube is live. Um, any other questions besides whether or not I'm competent enough to start the class? Just to recap for the people on YouTube, camp session help hours, office hours, professorvirtue.com slash schedule. I'll put a link to that in the description below. See how that is by the YouTube thing there. I have one professor. Please, please like and follow and subscribe. All right, now I'm all set for YouTube. I have a question. Um, so when trying to submit spreadsheet, a spreadsheet on question 10 of the quiz most recently, it required me to search for a file through my computer and it wouldn't allow me to use Google Drive. I was able to convert my spreadsheet to Excel to be able to actually submit, but would like to be able to use Google Sheets in the future. How do I um, put in a Google Drive thing? Uh, uh, I can change it so that we'll accept a file or a link. So I'll do that. I made a note to myself. Thank you. Um, uh, anything else? Are the cam hours, are those just walk-in or do you have to set up an appointment to do that? That's just walk-in. Um, and, and so it'll be the same Zoom link that we were using last Friday. And I think that's published on the uh, on the M1800 this week, right under the cam. Let me check that. Um, yeah, so where it says on M1800 this week, cam assignment two, the, the link underneath that, goes to a Zoom that will be live at those hours. Um, and somebody will be there that presumably knows how to answer CAM questions. Uh, is there any progress being made on uh, remote labs? Uh, I'm still waiting on a when to uh, meet. Yeah, we have to settle that this week. Um, how demanding will like the catch up work be to try yeah. to, okay. Yeah. You haven't missed any of the remote lab-ish kind of things that we were gonna do, uh, but but we need to start that this week so we don't fall behind. So, um, could you email me that question so that I remember? Oh no, post it in the discussion forum. So oh, nice. for to respond, and I'll, I'll put a link in the discussion forum. And the, in the content for the remote labs, won't be hidden from the rest of the class. Everybody can know what we're doing. But basically, you're going to do the metrology kind of stuff that we were doing in lab this week. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, some of the machining operations and things that we're doing. And um, and then when we get to the assembly part, you've got your kit so you can do the assembly and we can talk about how that uh, makes different parts work. So it'll be slightly different from what we're doing in the lab, but uh, it will get to the idea. So if you post that in the discussion forum, I'll respond today. Anything? Go ahead. Um, compared to last, to the um, last aside, uh, last cam, how long is this cam? Is this cam longer? Is this about the same length? Yes, it's intended to be about the same length. Okay. The uh, the the they stay the same sort of amount of time and effort because we expect you to remember stuff from before. And so as, as the term goes on That's further, fair. there'll be more stuff to do, but it should take less time. Uh, and, and if that's not true, let us know and we can, we can adjust things. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty flexible about all these things, especially with our uh, interesting method of course delivery this term. Um, all right. If there's anything else, um, you can shout it out in the chat or uh, let's see, in the chat. Um, yeah, so there's a question about the two points for the spreadsheet. And as we get to you, as we go through the spreadsheets, checking them, you get your two points. 
so far, I haven't seen anybody that did not understand what I wanted you to do, and, uh, and it all looked good. Uh, as we go this week, I'll give you some more examples of some ways that you could make your spreadsheet better. Um, but in, in a lot of ways, the spreadsheet part of the assignment is for your benefit and also to teach you the skills of how to, uh, how to make a model like this and then use it as you move forward. Um, so today, does anybody remember what we're talking about today? Energy and power. Energy and power. Here we go. Here it is. So, energy and power. As so, if if we talk about manufacturing engineering and manufacturing and operating a manufacturing company. If I say we're, our, our topic is gonna to be energy and power, what, what are some things that come to mind? Why don't you type in the chat uh, for just a few seconds. So what do you think the topic of energy and power as related to manufacturing? Um, actually, you know what I'm gonna do quickly? I'm gonna try something new here. There's a way for me to create breakout rooms. And I have never done this before. How the hell do I create breakout rooms? Went or participants. Control chat before meaning for caption. All right, we'll try that next time then. Instead of doing breakout rooms, type in the chat very quickly, what do you think talking about energy and power means with relation to manufacturing engineering, specifically this course? Um, so take uh, 45 seconds, a minute to type that. So far, Ron has typed. So what I'm seeing come through is efficiency of machines and machine use, um, THR, that may have not been the whole thought, um, energy required to produce a product, what it takes to make a part. Um, so energy required to make a product. Uh, how much energy the power is required, amounts of force it takes to make a part, running machines, how the parts will be machined, efficiency of a machine, energy cost, how much power required to manufacture a part, energy, uh, energy capacity to work, how much work over time. Yeah, okay, we got physics cores, um, amount of energy. Physics love right hard, sorry. That's all right. Mechanical power, machine must output to make the part. Okay. All right, so it seems like you guys have got a good understanding of energy and power and why it might be interesting. I want to do an example. Can you guys hear the audio here? Audio adds a lot to this. I don't think you can. Cannot at the moment. I yeah. think there's some like, kind of audio sharing feature, but I don't know how to enable it. Yeah, let me see if I can fix the audio in the screen share. Share. Share computer sound. Share. All right. Now that's got audio. Not audio. Oh, wrong speakers. That's why. Now we should have some audio. Can anybody describe? Can anybody describe the cutting operation we're watching? 
the facing path to level out the part. Right, it's a facing operation. It's using a face mill as moving across the top of the part. What are the process variables for a facing operation that we want to consider? How much material you're taking off in one pass? So, so which is actually volumetric material removal rate. So the speed at which you remove the volume from the material, which is something we're going to talk about today. But what, what is the volume that's being removed? What's the rate that we're removing volume then if we had to think about our process variables of machining? What would we have to know? Would we have to know the depth of cut and the width of cut? That would give us an area. And yep. then the speed that we're going across the material, that would give us an area times a velocity. An area times a velocity would be a volumetric rate. Does that make sense? Area times velocity gives you a volumetric rate. And so we've got our depth of cut. We've got our width of cut. The width of cut in this case is three inches because that face mill is three inches wide and we're cutting off a three inch wide piece of material. Our depth of cut, we, I believe in this experiment, we'll have to watch the video for me to be sure, but I'm pretty sure in this experiment, we varied our depth of cut. We maintained the same velocity across the part and we maintained the same width of cut. And so what I wanted to do here was to show how with the change in volumetric material removal rate, we can see something about the energy being consumed and the power that it takes to make this cut. And so let's go ahead and watch this video again. Oh, back. Can't hear me through the video, yeah. Uh, what do you notice between the first and the second cut? I'll try not to talk when the video is going. So any observations from watching it? So as we do our manufacturing science and a lot of what we're talking about this week comes from manufacturing science and we'll talk about how we as engineers we can use it. But if we're talking about manufacturing science, if we're studying something, we've got our, our independent variables, that speed, speed, depth of cut, right? The width of cut, the depth of cut, and the speed at which we go across the part. Those are our variables that we can change. We've changed depth between the first and second cut. Did we observe any difference? I'll run it again. So I noticed, so there was more spindle load. So we've got, a, we've got in the screen, a picture of the spindle load meter. So it should be obvious that I expect that to change. That's why I'm monitoring it. So the spindle load on the second cut was um, higher. The first cut is actually taking less depth of cut. So the volumetric material removal rate is smaller on the first cut the spindle load was smaller. And so uh, that spindle load is actually a measure of the current going to power the servo motor that drives the spindle. And so in, in the, the uh, let me get rid of this thing. It actually, it, it talks about percent power. And the reason for that is depending on the spindle speed, there's a different amount of, uh, of power available to the machine tool. It's like, it's like a car engine or anything like that. At different RPMs, you have different amounts of power available. 
And so this is the percentage of the amount of power available at full power there. And if you look closely, you'll see that the gauge goes from zero to 180% power. When you get to 100%, it turns yellow up to 150%. And then from 150% to 180%, it turned red, or the little needles next to the red. Why would it not go from zero to 100%? Any electrical engineers in the group? So why does our spindle load not just go from zero to 100%? Why does it go to 180%? The machine will actually go up to 200% power. The gauge only goes to 180. It's, well, partly I think it's for marketing. It's nice for the marketing people to be able to say that the machine can run at 150% power all day long and it won't damage the machine. But, uh, but also it's because very often at starting the spindle and stopping the spindle, you have a, a very extreme amount of power used, and then it settles down to some steady state. And so in, as the tool engages, it takes a lot of power to overcome that initial engagement, and then it steadies down to some steady state. Um, and it's really the average power over time that's important for damaging the machine. Um, all right, so we've done the first two cuts. Let me play the third cut. So what did you notice on the third cut? It went into the, it went over a hundred percent and started making some weird noises. Um, it went over a hundred percent and it certainly made a different noise. What, what would it count? And, and what was mostly changed about the noise was the frequency, right? And so what would account for the change in frequency of the, of the noise generated by the spindle? It's not moving as fast. It was not moving as fast. You could hear that it was slowing down. <clears throat> what happens if it slows down too much? Might not be able to create a chip. If it slows down too much, it won't be able to create a chip. Um, and well, What's going to happen in, is um, eventually the amount of power going to the motor won't be enough for the motor to spin anymore, right? And if that happens, it stops. Now, if the spindle motor stops, but the feeding continues to happen sideways, what do you think happens to the tool and the workpiece? They come apart <clears throat> or one of them breaks. Something bad happens to the tool and workpiece. And so when you hear that tool slowing down like that, it means that the power to form the chips on the edge of the tool exceeds the power that you're able to put into the spindle motor. So when that spindle slows down like that, you've exceeded the capacity of the spindle motor. Now, can you do that? Is it okay? And, and when you're, if, if you're doing the labs this week and last week, you noted that certain times in the milling operation, the, um, the spindle would slow down a little bit as the tool was more engaged in the workpiece, right? And you'll certainly notice that in the lab this week. Uh, it's using a tool almost exactly like this one this week. So is it okay for the spindle to slow down a little bit during the operation? Any guesses? Yeah, it just can't slow down too much. It can't slow down too much, right? If it slows down too much. And so if this cut had been longer, so this was about five inches across, if it had, if it had needed to go 15 inches across, it probably would have stalled the spindle before it got across and it would have broken something. Uh, now, these machines know that that's bad 
And so if the spindle stops, it goes into an alarm mode and the XYZ don't move either. It's just like hitting the emergency stop. Um, so it tries to save itself when that happens. Um, but yeah, so if, and so these mini mills at their peak horsepower is about six horsepower. It's at about 4,000 RPM. This is spinning about 6,000 RPM. So it's got something less than six horsepower um, spinning it. Uh, the VM2 that we have in the, in the next room in Washburn 108, that has a 30 horsepower spindle. So it's five times as much power as this one. So if you really want to put chips in the bucket, you use the machine tool that has more horsepower. All right, so it slows down, things break. Um, and so this tells us that power is certainly important. Power is important in manufacturing because it costs money, right? In fact, what are the primary degree requirements to get a degree in mechanical engineering at WPI? Does anybody know? Can somebody rattle off the areas that you have to be, um, you have to, Finish requirements in to get a degree in mechanical engineering from WPI. Most of you are mechanical engineers, you must know what the degree requirements are, right? Do you have to uh, do you have to take a, a class in design? Yes, you have to take a class in design, but you don't have to take all your classes in design. You don't have to take all the design classes. You have to take math and physics. Yep, everybody at WPI has to take some math and physics. Um, you have to take at least one other science besides physics and mechanical engineering. Everybody does chemistry. Uh, all right, maybe not everybody. Math, physics, chemistry. To get a degree in mechanical engineering at WPI, you have to have one class in material science. You have to know something about materials that we make stuff out of. You have to have something like three or five classes in thermofluids. Is that true? There's a large thermofluids component in mechanical engineering degree at WPI. Um, you have to have some sort of a realization class. This class can satisfy your realization requirement. Um, and that's the primary requirements for a mechanical engineering degree anywhere in the world. And if you think back 150 years when WPI was founded, what did you have to know to be a manufacturing engineer in a factory? You had to know about thermodynamics and fluids because we powered our factories with things like steam power and water wheels. You had to know a little bit about materials because you're going to make something out of materials. You had to know a little bit about design, but primarily, what we're teaching as mechanical engineering degrees today is what you had to know to be a manufacturing engineer 150 years ago when all of our schools were founded that starts this. Um, so it takes power to do manufacturing. Power is very important to us. Right now the power comes in like magic on a power line from the outside. Most manufacturing facilities don't operate their own um, power plant. Not going to say all of them don't, because some of them do. Um, a lot of paper mills operate their own power plants. And there are other plants with cogen, other factories with cogen facilities. But mostly, we get our power from the power company. It comes in on a line. So we don't worry so much about that side of power. But you can imagine if you're planning to cut a part, and this is important to you when you're making prototypes for your MQP. If you're planning to cut a part and you create a cutting operation that will break the spindle on the machine tool, is that good or bad? It's bad. So planning to break the spindle on the machine tool is bad. Perfect. If we had to consider what does it take, what does it take What impacts the amount of power that it will take to make a cut? You guys have either had physics or you're taking physics now, and there's no way you came to WPI without having taken physics in high school. So you guys all know uh, enough physics to answer this question. You may not know the specifics. 
They may not know where to look up the information, but you know enough to answer this question. So if I wanted to design an experiment to test things, if I wanted to know how much power it takes to cut something, what are the factors I need to control in my experiment? Shout them out to me. So unmute yourself and talk. I get tired of listening to myself talk sometimes. Machine, you'll want to probably use the same machine if it's um, durable enough to go through this. So, so the machine tool itself. Or yeah, machine tool rather. The machine tool will impact how much power is available to make the cut. Um, and so there's some things about the machine tool that we want to keep track of, uh, but mostly, now when we observed the cutting operation, when we watched the face mill grow across the top of the part, we were able to observe the changes in power, right? And if we wanted to measure that power, we could actually measure the current going to the spindle, and we could convert that current into horsepower, and so we measure the current going to the spindle. We convert that current into horsepower. We could know how much power did it take at the spindle to do the cutting operation. Now you can imagine if we, so with this three, three insert base mill, it's coming on the part, it's coming off the part. There's some dynamic stuff going as it enters the part and leaves the part. There's some dynamic stuff going on as each flute enters and leaves the part. But if you did this with a turning operation, where you had one spinning workpiece and one cutting insert, you could simplify that model a lot, right? So it's, and it's the same physics happening. So what we'd like to know though, is how efficient, we've got a factor of E that stands for efficiency. Can you guys see the board? So how efficient is the machine at getting power from spindle to chip. Because it's the power at the chip that influences how fast that tool is, or how much that tool has to slow down. So we have a, a machine tool efficiency that we've got to worry about. And, and what causes it to lose efficiency between the spindle motor and the chip is friction, the bearings and things like that. So there's, there's mechanical components. They might be a belt drive. And so you'll lose a little bit of efficiency in the belt drive, but we can easily measure the power that goes into the machine. So we have a factor that shows how much power does it lose getting to the end of the tool. We can know something about that. Now, if we consider the chip interacting with the workpiece material, and remember, so that if we zoom in on it, We've got our tool moving this direction with our velocity, right? That's the velocity of the tool moving through the workpiece. The chip is going out that way. And we've got deformation happening here where it's shearing off, the chip is shearing off from the workpiece material. It's flying up that way. So as we look at that, I'm not sure I asked you the question, Siri. As we look at that, this power right here at the cutting edge of the tool mm -hmm. that's causing that chip to form. Now, what do you think the factors are that impact the power that's happening here that's causing this deformation, causing the chip to fly off? What would impact how much power it takes? Yeah. Say again? RPM. So the RPM. So the, what we really care about is the velocity, right? So what's that velocity? The feet. Well, not really, not, not usually. It could be the feed, but it's not usually the feed. It's really the service feed.
So that velocity is important to us. Now, we talked about the fact that the volumetric material removal rate's important. We observed it, right? All we changed in that uh, cutting experiment that we showed in the video was the volumetric material removal rate by changing the depth of cut. We kept the width constant, we kept the feed constant, we kept the speed constant, we changed the depth. And so we've got volumetric material removal rate, which for some reason we usually call Q. Now, what else would impact how much power it takes to make a cut in machining? The material. The workpiece material. And anybody that's ever done any cutting, whether it's with a hacksaw in your garage or in a machine shop using a milling machine or something like that, you know that different materials take different efforts to cut, right? So for example, don't quote me, it's on a further slide in the presentation though, but I'm pretty sure that cutting stainless steel takes seven times as much energy as cutting aluminum. And so what we have is we have a factor a volume or a, a, um, a material specific factor, we call that K. We call it KP. And that's, and they figure these things out by doing lots and lots of experiments with a bunch of different materials. So they figure out what is the factor that's associated with the workpiece material that impacts how much power it takes to make that chip. What else do you think is important if we're figuring out, so we've got our machine tool efficiency, we've got our volumetric material removal rate, we've got some factor that's associated with the workpiece material and we can do an experiment to find out what that factor is. What else would probably impact the making of the chip and the power it takes? Okay. Say again? I have a question. Go is ahead. Capital K or lowercase k? I always use a capital K. What? I always use a capital K. Okay, I was just checking, thank you. Um, this is not quite as formal as in thermodynamics and fluids where you have to have the variable exactly correct, otherwise the teacher fails you. As long as you know what you mean when you write it down, it's okay with me. But I think it's always a capital K. Um, material removal rate, material unit energy, let's call it, efficiency of the machine tool, what else could impact it? What if, because you guys have done this before, what if my tool didn't have a sharp point on it? What if the point on the tool became dull? Do you think that would change the amount of power it takes to make the cut? You would have to work um, twice as hard to get the same. So has anybody, um, has anybody ever cut something with a sharp knife and then cut something with a dull knife? Yep. I kind of done that. I've done I I don't quite know how to tell something sharp or not it with scissors that is, but I've done something with similar with scissors. If you've got dull scissors, you're not cutting, you're tearing and exactly. same same thing. So we've got the material removal rate, we've got our KP, we've got a sharpness factor. So how sharp is the tool? which for some reason we call W. Now, can we think of anything else that might impact how much power it takes to, uh, to make the chip? So, so we know this, it's gonna depend on the material removal rate, the workpiece material, how sharp the tool is. 
Of course, if we're measuring it at the spindle, then we want to know how much of that power actually gets to the tool. But is there anything else that you think of? The actual size of the chip? The size of the chip is in here in our material removal rate. Could there be like a tool slope, like this versus this? Um, yeah, that's pretty much in the sharpness factor. So when we change this here, it actually changes the, the cutting angle of the tool. And that's taken care of in the tool sharpness factor. So you're thinking of changing the rake angle. And that will, you can, so yes, but it's not inherent to the cutting process. And we'll talk about that probably at the beginning of the next lecture since we're just about out of time here. But um, so power, it turns out that when they do all these experiments, I said they're gonna do a bunch of experiments to find the KP value, right? When they do all these experiments and they, they were certain that material removal rate had to have an impact. They were certain that the sharpness of the tool had to have an impact. And when we create a model, of anything that we're trying to, to model. We have a theory, we say, we think these factors influence it. And then they do control experiments where they change those factors. They kept being a little bit off. And finally, somebody realized that the feed rate, although it was captured by material removal rate, had more impact than the other parts of material removal rate. And it turns out that it, going faster or slower had a direct impact on it. And they came up with what we scientists affectionately call a fudge factor. And so they knew that how fast you were going also impacted it. So they said, all right, let's have this factor we call C. We'll call it the feed rate factor and we'll develop a table and you can look up from the table depending on what your feed rate factor is, how much that affects your thing. And so the power of the cut equals the power of the cut equals KP times W times C times U. And the power at the spindle equals the power at the cut times E. And so now you can estimate if you know something about the material, if you have a book where you can look up the reference, you can estimate how much power is it going to take to do this cut in this material on this machine tool. So that seems like a pretty good tool for engineers. Everybody agree that sounds like a pretty good tool for engineers? Uh, I will uh, put up the slides for the lecture. I didn't go through the slides, but all the information is there. And tomorrow when we start, because we're right at the time now, Tomorrow when we start, we're gonna pick up with this equation. So power equals these factors. But if we examine the units for power, because remember engineering's math is just a bunch of word problems cancel the units. If we examine the units for power, we can find other ways to estimate the power. And we're going to start with that tomorrow, and then we'll get into the forces on the tool chip interface, how to estimate those forces, and how to understand how that impacts the, uh, the power and the finished part. So I think this will be the first lecture that I actually finish right on time. Unless people have questions, I can hang out and answer questions. But uh, I thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow. I'll make sure the lecture slides get posted. I'll make sure the syllabus actually gets posted. Um, and we'll get all the CAM and the spreadsheets graded uh, today. We'll get that back to you for feedback. Thank you, Professor. Uh, if you have a question, just shout it out.
I'll stay on for a minute here. I had a question about question seven on the quiz, the PPK calculator thing. So I people thought that that wasn't grading correctly. Is that your question? Yeah, was I, were the LSL and USL values in the lecture? Uh, they were on the different page in the sheet. There's a, there's a drawing in the sheet. But uh, that was, I, I determined after people asked questions about it, that, that question wasn't worded that well. So if you had a problem, just send me an email and I'll go take a look at yours and, uh, and we'll adjust as needed. Thanks. All right. I'll see you guys tomorrow or I'll see you in lab today.